Well, I'm going to dive right into the questions. Um, D David, you have said that the energy industry should emulate the practices of some of the biggest tech companies in the world, Amazon, Apple, Facebook, and Google. But an important difference between that industry and the energy industry is that people don't notice, let alone care, about energy and climate change until energy prices are high, or even worse, it goes away altogether. Um, so how do you make people care about climate change and energy like they do their iPhones? Well, Amy, uh, that, you sort of hurt my feelings with saying people, people don't care about what uh, I, I worked my whole career on. But, but, but it, it is true, the, the fundamental difference, uh, if you think about energy and particularly the part of the energy sector that I come from, which is the electricity sector, that there's, there's really nothing that's more fundamental to modern life and, and that the population is more indifferent to. Uh, you know, electricity, maybe water, and and so how do you make people aware? Uh, there's one statistic I saw said that the average American spends six minutes a year thinking about their energy decisions, and uh, and so that's uh, compared to some study that I saw people check their phones 60 times a day. Yeah, I actually I heard that statistic too. Uh, some a person picks up their phone 1,500 times a week. Uh, and 97% uh, and of people sleep within three feet of their phone, and it's on. I think uh, we've all checked our phones in the middle <laughs> of the night. Uh, we, the don't, we don't have that level of uh, engagement in the energy sector, and part of it, part of it's the nature of the industry. Uh, our industry has been a command and control industry. The consumer has absolutely no choice, particularly on the electricity side. Uh, y your provider is given a monopoly in whatever geographic area, but that's all changing. And so we, we need to just uh, make people more aware. And fortunately, there's a series of projects, uh, products coming along that are at least somewhat more interesting. Maybe they're not iPhones, but I find in my own life that people are more interested in the, in the prospects of making a lot of their own electricity with solar power. And you know, people have talked about solar power since the 60s, but now the price point is where it needs to be. Uh, electric cars are obviously uh, interesting. So the technology exists. The, the key is to get it out of that 15% of the population that sort of falls into, you know, sort of the innovator early adopter and into the 70% of the population that sort of sometimes, you know, to date myself, what was called during the Vietnam War the silent majority, to get the 70% of the population to embrace clean energy and then we would be on our way. So um, you spend a lot of your time talking about, you know, this importance of shifting to clean energy and renewable energy and, and addressing climate change, which is somewhat of an anomaly, I would say, in the utility industry, which is predominantly fossil fuel based. Um, but of course, your company is actually almost 95 percent made up of oil, coal and natural gas, and just about 5 percent of your uh, megawatt assets are generation is renewable energy. Um, so do you have a specific target in mind um, going out, looking out into the future um, that you want to get that 5% number up to and correspondingly decrease um, fossil fuels? And if you don't have a goal, do you want to make one up right here and <laughs> share it with all of us? Well, the main thing, if, I, I think one of the things that, that is not uh, part of the CEO's job description enough is, is how do you uh, mitigate the risks of your company from disruption? And, and there's, uh, you know, there's a lot of theory of disruptive change. We've seen it in every industry. It's shocking, but when I was you know, young in the 1970s, the telecom industry was often referred to in the same breath as the electric industry. You know, these are the two utilities in the United States, and the telecom gets deregulated, gets broken up, and now it's this hot, sexy, it's basically in the IT industry, while well, we're still working our way out of the primordial ooze, you know. And so uh, um, I, I don't have a specific target, and I, and I would say I'm not even hostile to fossil fuel. I mean, one of the key technologies that's come along that has to work if you're going to do something about climate change and, and, just as, and this is classic, it's called post-combustion carbon capture technology. Clearly the name was not thought of by a marketing person. Uh, uh, the same people who came up with the word fracking, I think. <laughs> That's right, fracking, yeah, the F word. So, uh, um, but post-combustion, I mean, basically, uh, the, 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 there are fossil fuels and then there's coal, right? I mean, uh, Usually coal has been more than 50% of the electricity production in the United States. Now, because of low natural gas prices, more like 40%. But it's twice as carbon intensive as natural gas. The average age of a coal plant in the United States is 40 years old. 
uh, that means that the coal plants were built in the 1970s. In the 1970s, they built plants to last 30 or 40 years because in the 1970s, they thought in 40 years' time, nuclear power would be so cheap uh, that you wouldn't need coal plants. And so we see how well people are, uh, how good people predict the future. But, but the average age of a coal plant in China is less than 10 years old and will uh, w with certainty be operating in the year 2050. So globally, if we want to do something about climate change, we will be using coal, we will be using natural gas, we need to get the, the carbon out of that. And that's one of the areas where we have just announced the largest post-combustion carbon capture project in the world, which is being built with DOE support uh, in Texas. Uh, going back to that goal question, though, I mean, the, of course, the Obama administration has a goal with this new EPA climate change rules to cut 30% uh, of the carbon based on 2005 levels by 2030. I mean, do you think, given um, how important climate and energy, clean energy is to your company, have you thought about creating some sort of goal? Uh, we have thought about creating goals for, for, the, for the company. Y yes, we have. And, uh, but I think the, the thing that's a little bit unnerving about the Obama administration's 2030 goal, I mean, I sort of off it as wh where would we need to be by 2050 because that seems to be the year, the year that the world scientists focus on. And 2030 is a little bit of a convenient year uh, to sort of say, look how great we are because from now until 2030, natural gas displaces coal and you sort of naturally get this carbon reduction. But the reason you pick 2030 instead of 2030, uh, 2050 is between 20 and th 2050, if, if we just stay on our present course, natural gas will dislodge nuclear. Uh, every nuclear plant in the country will retire between the year 2030 and 50 because we haven't built a new nuclear plant in this country. Uh, the last one permit was 1979. Uh, so they'll all be at the end, and when, and when gas displaces coal, you reduce your carbon reduction. When, obviously, when gas displaces nuclear, you go in the wrong direction, and that's not what we can afford to do. So we have to figure out, we have to look at the, the path, the glide path down from 2030 to 2050. So, so on that note, going out to 2050, maybe even, you know, um, 500 years, uh, going forward from that. Um, there's been a lot of talk about natural gas being so good for climate. I think um, people close to the administration say that it's essentially their climate policy right now because, as you say, the, the emission reductions are coming naturally. Um, but because it displaces nuclear power and renewable energy, um, do you think that on a net benefit basis going out 100 years, will natural gas be good for efforts to address climate change or net negative? Uh, I think if, if handled properly, natural gas is definitely on the positive side. Uh, and I mean, but first of all, of course, you've got to create responsible fracking, and that, from a climate change perspective, means uh, making sure that you're getting the fugitive methane. Do you, you think know, it's being done safely now? I think, well, it's, I think 80, 90 percent of the companies that are fracking, which are the bigger companies, tend to do it in a responsible way. Uh, but but they're doing it because no one's requiring them to do it, and, and, and uh, whether you're talking water table or, or fugitive methane, I think that there are still a lot of mom and pop shops that don't use, exercise the same level of control. So, so I've, certainly I would support what I would call responsible uh, fracking. But, but the key is to make sure that the, con the, that the world doesn't get hooked on natural gas because, you know, I've seen people study this, and if we go to what uh, people in the industry sometimes call it the natural gas world by 2050. You're talking about like a four degree centigrade increase, uh, which is not anything that any of us want to see. So uh, the key is, as, as some in the pragmatic environment will say, to use natural gas as a bridge fuel. I think the, the oil and natural gas boom happening in the country has elongated that, that, that short bridge to a very, very long road. Um, mm. Do you think um, the oil and natural gas boom is, is, can help our efforts to well, actually, that climate change or make it more difficult? I mean, one of the things that I feel, I mean, if you think about it, energy is actually the one sort of infrastructure, the critical infrastructure in the United States that, for whatever reason, has always been in private hands as opposed to in the public sector hands. But what but what I love about the fracking, if I think of, you know, uh, we would all like to have a framework established by Washington for what, what, does, what does the United States want to be, you know, when it comes to energy. Actually, two of our biggest markets are California and Texas. 
And California and Texas have a very different view on, on climate change and the world. But both of them have a pretty definitive view on where they want to be as a state. So, you know, we can respond to what you want. Uh, but what I like about uh, where oil and gas is happening in the United States is if you were talking five or ten years ago and you were sort of talking about the idea of American energy independence, you would have been delusional. No, people would say it's just not even possible. Uh, but, but, you know, domestic oil production has increased from four million barrels a day to eight million barrels a day. Natural gas, you know, now we're an exporter when we were building importation facilities five years ago. So what I like to think from a political perspective is, I think if, if, if public policy is going to support climate change, it's actually probably going to be phrased in terms of achieving energy independence and creating domestic jobs because all those things will happen. But the oil and the gas industry and the solar and the wind industry, you know, have to stop sort of thinking of it as a zero sum game and, and actually working together to, to uh, as you know, I think natural gas is actually what enables solar power. Uh, 43 million American homes are tied to the natural gas system. You know, the solar power on your roof doesn't work at night. You know, if you had a device in your basement that could turn natural gas into electricity, plus the solar power on your roof, uh, you would be set. Maybe you should start the Natural Gas Solar Association. <laughs> yeah, that's, a nat that's natural gas. And how important, on a scale of one to ten, how important are public policies, such as EPA's climate change rules, you know, the Energy Department's loan guarantee program, how important are those policies to, to, to getting this shift to clean energy? Is ten being the, the um, incredibly important and essential and one being somewhat irrelevant? Well, I would say, like in a lot, of, I mean, uh, people don't get a sense of how big the energy industry is. So first, can you pick a number? Uh, well, I would say at the startup phase, uh, government support to, to get over that what VC people call the valley of death is important on an eight to ten. Uh, once the industry is more mature, I think it sort of drops to three or four. Uh, uh, but. What was, the, was I supposed to give two numbers? No, 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 that's second? good. That's okay. Two's better than uh, one. Okay. Um, yeah, see, so you, you inter now I can't remember what I was actually going to... Would you say your, your carbon capture sequestration project is more in the um, 8 to 10 level of oh, yeah. government support? Oh, yeah. If, if you were allocating government money right now, I mean, and, and we, we have, we got, uh, we were recipients of loan guarantee money for sort of big solar projects and um, you know, the, the, the two things that have made solar cheap now around the world are Germany, you know, who went early and now everyone in the world should thank Germany because the German population is paying an enormous amount for solar, but they created a market. And then the, uh, the stimulus in terms of created a domestic market that has caused the price of solar panels in this country to drop by 70% since the beginning of the Obama administration. So now it's affordable. So. Uh, so, you know, I, I think that, that that's very important. And carbon capture technology, as long as you don't have a price on carbon, I mean, I'm a big believer that the private sector can lead this social movement, but the private sector is, is you know, it's profit driven. The private sector will not solve for something for which there is no price. And so carbon capture, I mean, the only way we've made this billion dollar carbon capture project work is because where this plant's located, we can turn it into oil. Right, you know, which we, sort of defeats the whole purpose of yeah, the climate change. Yeah, well, we could get into a philosophical whether it does, but there's definitely the argument, yeah, okay, so I'm going to capture the carbon, use it to get oil out of the ground and turn it into gasoline. We would just say it substitutes, you know, domestic production for, it doesn't affect American demand for gasoline at all. But Do you think uh, companies can address climate change for altruistic reasons? I, I, th I think that they will. Um, I, I think what you see right now, and we would like to encourage this, is that you see people, uh, uh, you know, who, very, who are consumer-facing companies who are very concerned about sustainability, you know, writ large. And one of the big messages for the American public, when the sort of sustainability movement started in the 70s, the only thing the public could really do to show that, you know, they wanted to be sustainable was recycle. Um, but, but now you can embrace clean energy, you can buy an alternative energy vehicle, there's so many things you can do. And I think that the big brand name companies, the Coca-Colas, the McDonald's of the world, they do it because of their brand and also because their employees, employees are demanding it. 
Mm -hmm. Well, we have lots of employees in the energy industry, so maybe that's where you can start. And with that, we um, are out of time, and I would like to thank everybody for joining us. Thank you.